Hello, my name is Walid Brinjikji, and I'm going to be presenting a case of transarterial embolization of an internal maxillary artery, arteriovenous fistula, in a patient presenting with pulsatile tinnitus. Our patient was a 34-year-old female. She had a history of multiple right facial venous vascular malformations since birth, and presented to our institution for a second opinion regarding treatment of these lesions. Physical examination at the time demonstrated multiple bluish compressible vascular lesions in the buccal mucosa as well as in the subcutaneous tissues on the right side of the face. These lesions were consistent with venous malformations on both physical exam and imaging. The patient also, as an aside, informed us that she's had a history of pulsatile tinnitus over the past three years. When we asked her what type of workup she has had for evaluation of this pulsatile tinnitus, she informed us that she had undergone multiple CT scans and venograms, all of which were considered negative. In the clinic, we placed a stethoscope adjacent to her right ear and noted objective pulsatile tinnitus. A stethoscope recording is provided as follows. We reviewed the CT scan that was performed approximately two years ago and noticed arterialization of the pterygoid venous plexus on the right. Here we see the internal maxillary artery and the arterialized pterygoid venous plexus. For reference, one can see that the contralateral pterygoid venous plexus is not opacified at all. Based off cross-sectional imaging, it was clear that the patient had an internal maxillary artery fistula. Internal maxillary artery fistulas are quite rare, with less than 30 cases reported in the literature. These lesions can be congenital, post-infectious, iatrogenic, or post-traumatic. The most common symptoms are a pulsatile mass, brewy, pulsatile tinnitus, and unilateral pulsatile headache. These are usually single whole fistulae and not nidal type AVMs. The most common venous drainage is through the internal jugular or external jugular vein. And the primary treatment for cases reported in the literature is endovascular therapy. For our setup, we used a six French benchmark catheter, an Echelon 10 microcatheter, a Synchro 2 guide wire, and did embolization with Axiom coils and Onyx 18. A full six vessel cerebral angiogram was performed. The only opacification of the fistula came on the right external carotid artery injection. Here we see an arteriovenous fistula between a branch of the internal maxillary artery and the pterygoid venous plexus. On the unsubtracted images, you can see multiple densely calcified flebolis in the soft tissues of the face on the right. The angioarchitecture of the fistula is better demonstrated here, where we see an internal maxillary artery branch, which is diving directly into the pterygoid venous plexus. We suspected that this would be a single hole fistula. For navigation, we used the Synchro 2 guide wire to try to get into the artery that we thought was directly supplying the fistula. Once we were able to select the artery with the guide wire, we slowly advanced the Echelon 10 microcatheter into the feeding artery. We were able to catheterize the arteriovenous connection itself and place the microcatheter directly into the pterygoid venous plexus. 
Following successful positioning of the microcatheter, we then performed an angiogram to confirm appropriate positioning. Angiography demonstrated our microcatheter clearly within the pterygoid venous plexus. Because we knew that we were now in the venous pouch of the arteriovenous fistula, we then proceeded with coil embolization. The goal of coil embolization in this case was to slow down flow to the fistula and allow for embolization with liquid embolic agents without the risk for the agents flying downstream. We wanted to coil all the way back from the venous pouch to the actual feeding artery and then use our liquid embolic agent to achieve a complete angiographic cure. A repeat angiogram was performed following placement of a few coils, which still demonstrated persistent fistula and opacification of the pterygoid venous plexus. We continued to proceed with the coil embolization. Once it was clear that we had achieved coil embolization of the actual arteriovenous connection, we then decided to proceed with embolization using a liquid embolic agent. For this embolization, we used Onyx 18. Because we had achieved such dense packing of the fistula with the coils, less than 0.3 cc's of Onyx 18 was needed to completely occlude the arteriovenous connection as well as the feeding artery to the fistula itself. Post-treatment angiogram demonstrated complete resolution and angiographic cure of the arteriovenous fistula. We did do a complete six-vessel angiogram following the procedure to make sure that there were no additional feeders to the arteriovenous fistula. A concern was raised regarding the potential of coils protruding into the buccal mucosa surface. However, as seen here, the malformation was separated from the buccal mucosal surface by a layer of pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Immediately following the procedure, there was complete resolution of both objective and subjective pulsatile tinnitus. The patient was discharged home the next day and there were no postoperative complications. After three months of follow-up, the patient continues to have resolution of her tinnitus and is pain-free and has no difficulties with swallowing. Regarding the patient's venous malformations, our plan is to treat them with bleomycin sclerotherapy. These were distinct from the internal maxillary artery fistula from a both imaging and clinical standpoint. Thank you very much.